Hi, welcome to Dawn Cast. It's Kathy Ngo here, and today we've got a very special guest, Jeff Trappert, who is a former Paralympic Paralympian. I, whenever I say that really quickly, I just stuff it up. <laughs> Paralympic <laughs> athlete who has competed in two world championships, the Sydney 2000 Games and Athens 2004. He has since retired and is now the director of Inclusion Moves. Jeff does some important work in disability advocacy. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you. And just so you know, my word, my word that I can't spit out is specific. So, oh, oh, my God. I can't not, say that try as not well. Get me to, try yeah. not get me to speak about anything oh. specifically. Okay. And we'll, and we'll do all right. Yeah, that's funny because I can't say that word as well and <laughs> I avoid saying that word. Another one is, and I have to think about it, profiterals. <laughs> I say profit rolls. Well, well, like, why do these rolls get profit? <laughs> I don't get it too. So, like, I'll be um, halfway through an interview, and and my brain will be going, "Don't lead yourself down a line where you're going to need to say the word specific." Yeah, don't yeah. lead yourself down that line. What are you doing? Why are you leading? <laughs> you're doing it. You're doing it. I can hear you doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because the more we think about it, it's like the more it trips up on us. I'm like, don't, don't, exactly. don't, and it does, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> Well, again, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, how have the last couple of weeks been for you? Yeah, it's been um, different and yeah. testing, but testing in different ways. Um, I mean, for me, as a person with a disability, there's, um, for some people with a disability, coronavirus can be uh, a very, very big issue. Mm. Um, for any of those people that have got a health, that have got an underlying health condition, um, coronavirus can be absolute life and death. Mm. I'm lucky enough not to be in that category. Um, my disability means that um, I'm not in that category. Mm. Um, but trying to be respectful of those voices of those people that that are in that category and understanding that they may well seem to have um, a bit of a a bit of a negative attitude at the moment, mm. and understanding where that negative attitude comes from. Um, is really where a lot of the diversity and inclusion uh, people that work in that industry have, you've really seen some of the ones shine that, that are really understanding of other people's voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was following your Twitter and I noticed mm. that you were saying, you, you've updated your bio <laughs> on your Twitter, that your puppies yeah. and your wives and your kids want you out of the house. Um, I do. Yeah, tell us about like, because you normally work from home, don't you? So how different is it this time? I, my, most of my work um, tends to be either in a corporate environment or, uh, so most of my work tends to be doing inclusion and diversity planning with corporates. So yeah. um, I could be working in a corporate environment um, mm -hmm. and then I'm doing my policy writing from home. So yeah. um, whenever I'm doing anything, what I, what I term the boring stuff, um, writing policy, um, I tend to be doing it at home anyway. So yeah. I am one of those people where it hasn't really changed what I've, uh, the way that I operate as much as others. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does mean that I've, it, there's been a large, there's actually a large difference between choosing to be at home and being stuck at home. Mm. They're two completely different mindsets. Yeah. So okay. understanding the, the different emotions that come with each of those um, has been interesting. Yeah, that's right. Um, so how have you found this whole coronavirus and within the disability sector, um, particularly in the communication? Because I, I mm. hear that, you know, state and federal, like everyone has different uh, messages and it can be quite yeah. mixed. Um, so how do you feel? Like, do you see that as well? The first and foremost, in any policy, uh, in any policy context, whether it's coronavirus or not, what people with disability are, uh, and the disabled community want is to be noticed, mm. to be thought of, yeah. um, to, to be mentioned in a press statement, to be to be mentioned in a, to have a question asked about them from the press gallery. Mm. Um, that's universal across any kind of policy. Um, and coronavirus is, has been like, has been a little microcosm of that. For a, for a long time there at the start, I talk about for a long time, we've been, we've been in this for like six weeks, but yeah. For the first few weeks, people with disability were fighting just to be involved in the conversation. Yeah. So 
to be now moving on to being part of the conversation is a is a good step. Now it's around making sure that the the policies and procedures and the and the thinking that's happening is actually holding a person with a disability at the center of the conversation mm. um, rather mm. than a person with a disability being talked at. We tend to have a lot of and it's the same with a lot of minority groups. Um, we tend to be talked at rather than rather than discussed with. Yeah, uh, that, and that's right. Trying to turn that mind frame around is uh, is a lot of what advocates and uh, and activists do. Mm. Yeah, you're right because like I felt as though like since this thing um, since this thing started, everyone was very much you know looking out for themselves. Like, oh, you know, it's just the flu. It's not going to affect anyone. Yeah. It's not going to affect me, me, me. So it's the conversation was all about the individual, but like yeah. they were not thinking about other people in the community who were vulnerable. And it's not just about yourself, but it's about protecting yourself from others. Um, and I also found that, um, so I come from a culturally diverse background and my parents don't speak very good English. So they yep. were, I guess, left out of the conversation in the beginning because mm. yeah, that they, they yeah, it takes them a lot longer to fully comprehend what's going on. Um, mm. so you're right about that. How, long, was, did it, how long did it take for fact sheets to become available in other exactly. languages? Yeah, that's right. It's it, those kinds of things that, that really make a difference to the communication and then from a disability point of view, how long did it take? for fact sheets to become available in plain English. Um, for me, yeah. that's not an issue, um, but I still, I'm probably more troubled by the fact that I could be, I could be holding coronavirus within me and knowing that in, in, the, next, um, in the next month or so, yeah. I could be back out doing consultations with, um, with disabled people that are a lot more vulnerable mm. than me. So it's not, just about me it's about it's about those people that i might affect and um, mm. that's when you really start to see community um, come together and and see it as not a not an i problem but a we problem yeah. and that's a good step in the right direction and one that i hope that that we can keep going uh through this and moving into a new into a new future mm. is that on all manner of different topics we don't think about i um, we think about diversity as as a strength and making sure that we're ensuring that each one of those diverse individuals um, is able to have their say and is able to feel safe in having their say. Yeah, that's right. Um, I want to move into your um, Paralympic days because that's quite sure. fascinating. So you um, want to move way back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, not completely way back because this is not about... Um, you know, your full resume or anything like that. But I, I still have um, the Olympic and Paralympic memorabilia because it's like year 2000 yep. and all of that. Um, so, like, no, I'm because I've got a background in HR, so I'm always fascinated when people transition in their careers. Um, mm. So from being an athlete to the corporate yeah. world, what, what was that like? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. One per, oh, people tend to think of athletes as um, – they're an athlete, and there's no transfer of skills possible from being oh, an athlete over into the cor- over into the corporate world. They seem to think as we still seem to think of athletes as the meathead that you see on the news um, getting in trouble for such and such. But yeah, NRL there's players, so many different, <laughs> sorry, NRL players. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to mention any particular okay. sports, but if you were to mention a particular sport, there hasn't exactly been a lot happen in the uh, in the back pages of the sports in the sports page with NRL players getting in trouble in the last few weeks, has there? So no, I maybe wonder that why. Something. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, there's so many way, so many different aspects of being an athlete that you can transfer over in the corporate world. Like mm. my, my favourite one is always if you're looking for a person uh, to do goal setting in a strategic plan type setting, um, you look around the room and you find either the uh, find either the ex defence first defence force person mm-hmm. or the athlete. They're yeah. going to be the two people that have the two groups of people that have had the most experience in coming up with goals and and being mission oriented to get to a to get to a certain to get to a certain stage. Mm. It's going to be those guys, and that's one of those skills that stays with you from your sporting time into well well past your sporting time into your corporate career Mm, for me it's and it's things like confidence i i've been that athlete where 
when I was younger, um, yeah, as a teenager, I've had the politician come up to me wanting the selfie. Wow. So you, you have that experience as a teenager and suddenly when you go into a corporate world and you're sitting across the table in a, in a corporate environment from a politician or from a, um, from a director general of a, uh, of a government department, you realise more than any other person in that room that they are just another person. That's right. So you tend to be that person who doesn't mind calling a spade a spade and just going, hey, look, this is the way it is. Mm. Uh, because, and that's part of your upbringing. That's part of the, the experience that you've had um, as an athlete. And that's the same across any people come into advocacy uh, like, I tend, like I've ended up in from a number of different backgrounds. Some people will come in from a law background. They'll bring certain skills. Some people will come in from a human from a communication background, yeah. they'll bring in a different set of skills and athletes will bring in um, a different set of skills again. It's simply about life experience. Yeah, that that tenacity, that grit. Um, I was reading Angela Duckworth's book um, on grit. Sure. And it's just that yeah. athletes just have that tenacity, that resilience that, I mean, a lot of people don't have, that drive. Um, and it's the same with, I met um, a veteran recently, a um, yeah. Yeah, like it's just the same as well. But then um, like the corporate world, because I, I come from the corporate world, like it's yep. just basically a box. And if you don't fit in that box, then it's just like you're seen as the other, but it's just so, yeah, yeah, yeah you know what I mean. <laughs> one, one, thing I try and, one thing I try and teach in a corporate setting is one of those, one of those things, and grid is a part of it, one of those things that comes from an athlete is not, just because something's happened on a particular day doesn't mean it's going to happen on the next day. It's about learning from that. Mm. And that's the same um, whether you're winning races and losing races as it is with different projects in a business sense. Yeah. Just because you've achieved a certain result on a particular day, as long as you're learning from that and you're changing your outlook, you're changing your goals, you're adjusting things as you go. Yeah. That's what makes the difference between a shitty athlete and a shitty corporate worker. They're exactly the same. Yeah, it is. I, I agree with you. Um, so you're quite vocal and I love all your Twitter <laughs> posts, your LinkedIn posts and everything like that. Like I just – like you're the real deal. Like I just love the whole rawness of it. But mm. I also realise like some people don't particularly like that and they find that quite uncomfortable. Absolutely. Do you find this mm. every day or is it just depending on which type of post and tell us about that? It's it's actually really interesting which posts which posts get the most attention and um, and which posts don't and what kind of persona they expect a certain person to be mm. and it is true that if you come from a corporate setting you're expected to be more bland you're expected to be the grey person mm. you're but if you come from an athletics background or a sporting background then you're expected to be a little bit more out there and mm. it's about I find that in my work that I do is um, in advocacy and activism. It's, it's about the co finding the combination of those views mm. of sometimes we need those people that are um, the more corporate speakers that won't, um, that won't get in trouble, that won't, that won't say mm. something that's, that's going to offend. Yeah. Um, we need those down here doing this part of the work. And we also need those up here that are, willing to speak their mind yeah. it's the kind it's when you find ways of combining both those groups yeah you're right that you really get the true goal come out mm. because each communication mechanism and each way you communicate will attract a certain audience so i am i do like to think of myself as the person who says what they who says what they mean um, i don't want to be simply that person who runs an organisation that receives government funding. So therefore, um, whether true or not, I will, I will feel as though I need to keep um, hammering home the government message. Mm. Um, there are good organisations that even though they take government funding, don't do that. Mm. But there are organisations that do when times are tough and coronavirus is one of those. Yeah. Um, they gravitate to those more bland messages and important and independent voices are very, very important. So finding ways that we can fund those independent voices that will drag things along 
drag the the community thinking along is is very very important. Mm. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's about having when that. When we talk about diversity, yeah. we don't want the same to voice. be true to yeah. diversity. Mm. It means that you're not having the same voices speak yeah. over and over again. Yeah, that's um, right. If yeah. we were to do that, then we'd be a community of grey people and bland people. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And one post that I particularly remember is when you posted that you were listed on Keynote Worthy um, and just saying that, oh, you know, guys, just make sure that you have um, a diverse lineup next time, not a, um, mm. I can't remember the exact lines, but not a boring <laughs> white guy or yeah. something like that. Um, but you were making yeah. a joke out of it. And I think some people responded back, like <laughs> taking it so personally, but they didn't see like, you know, the sarcasm in the humour. <laughs> oh, and there's a certain amount, of, I remember that post, and there was mm. a certain amount of sarcasm to it, but there was a certain amount of realism too that I... Yeah. As a as a person with a disability, that is my diver- that is my diversity. Yeah. But other than having a disability, I I recognise that I've grown up with the privilege of being that white middle class, um, now middle aged guy in a suit. Yeah. So just because you are diverse in one aspect doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't grown up with some privileges as well. And mm. it's about understanding those privileges and and understanding that you've got to where you are because of them. They're not necessarily a bad thing by any mm. stretch, but understanding yourself and being able to be authentic is is what an audience is looking for in a public speaking environment. And it's what I work and it's what our employer is looking for more and more. Yeah. Um, the good employees anyway yeah. are looking for in a corporate environment. Yeah. Is that person who's willing to be authentic because that's where you get the truly innovative thinkers. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's a post that you put up on Twitter um, about the disabled you bring up toilets. All of my posts that I know. Probably written at midnight. Probably written at midnight <laughs> when I couldn't Maybe sleep. after a when few I beers. Sleep. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I kind of <laughs> sound like a major stalker at the moment, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Um, That's all right. Come on. I'm glad someone's reading. No, like I'm. I'm just doing my research, my due diligence here. Um, I didn't. I think. My awareness of disability didn't, I think, kind of, it wasn't as amplified until I had my baby. And when I was um, pushing him around in the pram, I was just like, WTF, like, how do disabled people get Mm. around? Like, I was just, it dawned on me, my privilege. And I just felt this sense of guilt, Um, you know, even getting access to this disabled toilets and everything like that. And I just remember one of your posts about, you know, it might be counterintuitive if um, when it's a, it, it – because um, there's always like a voice or something like that to say opened or closed or something like that. Yep. Normal – I wouldn't – sorry, I shouldn't say normal, but people like myself right. might think – You are oh, you are the stereotypical able-bodied person. There's yes, that's right, able-bodied person. I would think, what the hell, like why? But then just those posts, they're, they're factual, but they're very – educational and that's what I love um so it's just like um yeah thank you for doing that because I was just like oh my god this whole guilt but then the whole guilt like I I went I came I overcame the guilt because I was like okay Mm. what can I do about this you know it's Mm. just that realization and then the action so thank you um first of all you don't need to feel guilty because as a person with a disability we use you we use you mums with brands all the time in our arguments (laughs) <laughs> we we use you to bump our numbers up, make to make things more accessible. Yeah. Um, I'll be completely honest about that. Um, if if it wasn't for bring, if it wasn't for the for us being able to bring in other groups like that, mm. um, it's a sad fact that a lot of disabled um, things that have been that look to be positive for a disabled person simply wouldn't have happened. Because there will always be more um, mothers with prams um, pushing around prams that will be politicians mm. than what there will be disabled people. Mm. Um, hoping that one day that won't be the that won't be the case. But as a good activist and a good um, advocate, you use whatever group you need um, to push the the concept that you're trying to get across. Yeah. And when it comes to audience. Sometimes you need to use those tangents um, 
to be uh, be able to touch audiences that you wouldn't have normally been able to touch. Mm. Um, to be able to draw those those comparisons between something over here and something over here. Mm. Um, to show that um, this is important for all of us. So again, that comes back to diversity not necessarily being a bad thing, which is unfortunately the way that it's portrayed sometimes. Yeah, that's true. Um, diversity simply being a spectrum of that we're all on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so tell us about your, your advocacy work and inclusion <clears throat> moves as well, your, your business. Sure. So my my work is generally um, spread out into split up into two separate streams. Um, my inclusion and diversity planning with the corporate work is mm-hmm. um, what pays the bills. Yeah. Uh, and that allows me to the, to then take on what I'd call um, passion projects um, that are more your advocacy based funding, okay. uh, more your advocacy based um, work mm. um, that I do without advocacy funding. Um, because I find that if you're a an advocacy organisation um, that's funded by a particular state government, then it's going to be very hard, and there's going to be a conflict and um, and indeed a privilege mm. of you being funded by the by the organisation that you're you may you may be asked to take on um, a fight against by a customer. Um, to me, that will always be a conflict. So mm. I tend to use one income stream to be able to push. Um, to be able to allow me to do um, the other. Yeah. Um, I find that by doing that, I'm able to be a lot more honest and authentic in the uh, the advocacy work that I do. Um, so I know that when I'm fighting against a particular issue, it's not because um, it's not because there's a paycheck at the other, at the other end of the ta- at the other end of the, the journey. Yeah. Um, it's because it's genuinely because you're doing the right thing yeah, um, for that right. person or for that group. So what's your advice for people out there who want to do a lot more advocacy work, but mm. perhaps they feel a little bit, I guess, scared or they don't feel like there's a safe environment? Like how can people get started in that? For, for me, it's about finding your voice. It's about finding what are you passionate about. Yeah. Um, for me, I've kind of fallen into doing a lot of my advocacy work has been around transport. Um, that wasn't by that wasn't by design. Um, mm. From a business pers- perspective, that's probably the, the shittiest decision I could have ever made right at the moment, given that just about every kind of transport is shut down during coronavirus. Yeah. Um, transport as being something that I was um, that I that he- that a lot of my contracts hinged on wasn't the smartest business decision, yeah. but it was still where my passion lay. Mm. Um, and where with it, transport. Yeah. It needs the most with work as well. Yeah. With transport being such an enabler to try and bring people together, um, to me that's a that's a big issue and it's one that I feel passionate about. So it's one that I'm going to speak on and that's what I'd encourage everyone to, to find is find what your passion is. If your passion is around uh, cross-cultural, then, then by all means get involved in those conversations. Um, if, you're com- if your passion is around LGBTI, whether you fit that, that group or not, um, then by all means be an ally to set yourself up to be an ally for those groups. Yeah. Um, understand where those groups are, are heading. Understand what the mindset is of those groups mm. so that you're rowing in the same direction as them. Um, so it is about following as many people as you can on Twitter, following as many people as you can on LinkedIn so that you get a good understanding of what that group as a as an entirety um, believes and what they're what they're aiming for mm. so that you can be the best ally that, ally that you can be yeah definitely so back to coronavirus like how are you keeping yourself fit during this time um, you must like <laughs> work out every day as well because you look fit. You still look Yeah, well, the good thing is we've got lots of time at the moment, don't yeah. we? So um, for me, sport has always been a, a big part of my life and it's always, and it always will be. Um, not necessarily sport in a, um, uh, in a structured sense, but just having that healthy attitude and that, that healthy mindset of, achieve, and as I said earlier, of achieving goals. Yes. Um, having that goal that you're trying to achieve can be important. Um, 
can be important both physically and mentally. So you want to try and do 100 push up, 100 push ups in a day. That's what you're aiming towards. Um, that's your goal. Uh, I can't even do one. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> one's a one's a good start. I know better than half. <laughs> Push, pushing towards that goal is the most important thing. One of the one of the biggest things that we can one of the worst things that we can do um, in this coronavirus environment is to shut down. Is to is to think well, let's just shut down for the next for the next month or two months or three months or eighteen months. Mm. Um, I find it really important to keep to keep thinking, to keep coming up with that next idea, whether it's going to work or not work, isn't important. It's it's keeping your brain engaged, yes. and one of the easiest ways to keep your brain engaged is to keep is to keep your physical side engaged as well. Mm. Um, there's many studies that show that those that are um, that those those good ideas tend to come when you're thinking about something completely different. When you're thinking about, oh my god, how much pain am I? My going through on the bike at the moment is sometimes when some of those best ideas come. That's so right. So it's important to just keep doing something yeah. um, at the moment, whether that works, whether whether each one of those ideas work or not, um, is irrelevant. But shutting down is just not an option. Yeah, that's right. Have you developed any weird kind of hobbies like sourdough baking or anything ever since? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. My, I scared the living daylights out of my wife the other day actually yeah. because I came to her and said, I want to cook something and I need you to help me learn how to cook something. Ah. And I've never seen such a scared look on, in my wife's face before. <laughs> he was like, wow, this is really affecting me. This is this has gone too far. <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to get you back into, back into some in, into some serious work because this is just weird. <laughs> oh, that's why she wants me, you out of the house. <laughs> for me, a toasted sandwich is a is a gourmet meal. So, oh. no, I haven't developed anything that's that's really that's really out there. But I have started to look around the house of mm. uh, of those things that need to be doing, which is which is a good sign. It's showing that you that I, as I, as I said, you haven't shut down. You're still um, you're still thinking of the way out of this rather than we're stuck in it yeah trying to see that light at the end of the tunnel is is important Mm, yeah that's right so what's next for you for your business well for me for personal goals yeah i'll tell i'll tell you about one of the things that i've tried um, as an example of those of keeping your brain engaged i'll tell you about one of the things that i tried that that hasn't taken on i i i thought that during this time when there would be um a shutdown of gyms that it, it would be a positive to put together a group of physical trainers that would be able to do online training. Okay. Um, I thought that that made sense from a business perspective to um, to put that together. So I did. I spent um, spent a few days putting together putting together a website and the background and the the back end to that, and found my PTs that would like to be involved. And mm-hmm. as it turned out. Um, a lot of the PTs have gone and uh, and provided that provided that work um, pro bono, provided it for nothing, um, mm. and taken the business model out of it. So that's both a, a good thing community wise, mm. um, but did absolutely shoot my business model in the foot. But wow. that's one of those things that you learn. You learn that 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 idea wasn't the one that's going to work. Yeah. Um, that idea was one that um, the market and the community has decided is better served um, by a free model, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Um, so you move on to the next thing. What the next thing might be, I don't know yet. Yeah. Um, but it's keeping your brain engaged. It's making sure that you're thinking. It's um, making sure that you're still developing and keeping those relationships with those corporates that you um, that you worked with beforehand. Um, that you know will come out the other side of this because those that come out the other side of this and still see diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion as important and, and worth spending money on, mm. they are those ones that you want to work with. They are those ones that customers will want to gravitate to because there will be a period when they come out of the other side of this mm. where organisations will want to go back to what they see as their core business mm. and those that see diversity and inclusion as their core business will be, I believe, 
those ones that will that will benefit the most Definitely. because they're the ones that are ingrained in the culture they're the mm. ones that haven't seen it as the add-on where oh no we don't have the money for that right now so couldn't possibly do it mm. um so those ones that have ingrained it in the culture um properly from the start that will come out of this doing well um because they'll come out of it in a much stronger position than those that have hunkered down and and gone back to their what they see as their core business and they're the ones that are coming going to come out bland and grey yeah. and nobody wants to see that. So working and keeping relationships with those corporates is um, probably where I'm, where I'm sitting right at the moment. Yeah, and that's really important to continue those conversations um, because everyone is in the same, I guess, um, same boat pretty much. Um, you know, every, we're all feeling this and, yeah, I've been telling people as well, like just continue the conversation with your customers. Um, mm. You know, it's not necessarily about selling or anything like that. It's just about relationships, human to human, heart to heart. Yep. So lastly, how can people reach you? How can people get in touch with you to learn more about sure. what you do well, and Inclusion Moves? My, my website is uh, www.inclusionmoves.com.au. Um, I still, I think I sit, this is where I show myself not to be a very good businessman. I'm pretty sure my search engine um, optimization still puts me somewhere at the top of Google when you, uh, when you Google inclusion moves, but uh, through the website is a good way and at inclusion moves on Twitter and all yeah. of your social media is, uh, is where you can find me. I'm always happy to, to have a conversation. I seek out those people that, that don't think the same way as me. Yeah. Um, I get asked all the time, why don't you block people on Twitter that are clearly not thinking the same as you? And to me, that's just not the idea. Yeah, that's not um, the idea at all. <laughs> you, grow, you grow by having those conversations um, with right. people that don't agree with you. So yeah. even if you don't think the same as me, um, please seek me out. Um, yeah. I'm going to try and convince you of something that you don't believe in. But um, as you said, that conversation is where the real goal is. Mm, definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining Dawncast today, Jeff. No problem. Pleasure. Thank you. So listeners out there, that was Jeff Trappard, former Paralympic, I said it right, <laughs> athlete. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to Dawncast and thank you so much for watching today. Mm-hmm.